Welcome back, Dulcinea. And Thanks. welcome back, listeners and viewers, to the Being in the World podcast, which has become too infrequent. But I've been very inspired lately, thanks to you and our relationship. Um, there's, there's this kind of old-fashioned cliche of the woman trying to kind of fix the man in a relationship. It's, a, it's an archetype, I think. Um, I remember John Perry Barlow used to say that he used to marry people and the one condition he would give to agreeing to marry two people is that you have to love the person that you're with, not the person you think they can or should be. And I think that somehow we've uh, moved past this archetype and yet still manage to figure out clever ways to not change each other, but um, help nurture and foster the best that each of us can be. And one of the ways we've done this is through uh, kind of turning it into games that I enjoy that are competitive sometimes and um, it all began feel free to interject at any moment but I'm just giving a little introduction to what I wanted to talk about today about like giving tips to how couples can can help improve <laughs> each other without resorting to uh, annoying things like nagging or complaining about the other and I think that we've been pretty good about not doing that while at the same time making the encouraging desire to like uh, at least acknowledge behavior that maybe the person doesn't even like in themselves and then how to and it doesn't fall into the gender gender kind of cliche because mm -hmm. I think it all began with me trying to fix you not the other way around <laughs> <laughs> It all began, I think, with me wanting you to quit smoking cigarettes. And rather than um, rather than nag, which didn't work, I did try that. <laughs> Complain, resort to reason, uh, resort to fear and health issues. Um, the thing that worked in the end was a, a deal, a bargain. And the bargain was... Uh, why don't you say what the bargain was? Tao was gonna, or I proposed Tao getting trained in transcendental meditation and keeping it up in exchange for me quitting smoking. Now, you have to keep in mind that this is probably the most difficult thing you could possibly, I could possibly imagine. If you had asked me to, that I had to run 10 miles a day, it would have been easier than this idea of sitting still for 20 minutes twice a day. You, I would watch you meditate. You are of a very committed practice. How long has it been since you've missed a session? Almost three years. Three twice. years in November. Three years in November, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, no matter what is happening. We've been at a club, like rave in Burning Man, and you've <laughs> been in the corner doing your meditation. <laughs> That's the most extreme I've seen, I think. Um, but I tried before you made this proposal, I would sometimes just sit next to you and just see like, okay, let me just see if I can do five minutes. And I couldn't, I couldn't even do one minute. So the idea of sitting for 20 minutes was seemed so much more difficult than anything else you could possibly ask me. And, um, it seemed, but it also seemed fair. It seemed on par with how difficult it is to quit smoking because it is hard to quit smoking. And the idea of it having to go on was was great because like you told me basically you would not smoke for as long as I meditated twice a day. <laughs> Whew. But when you, when I, since I really wanted you to quit smoking, this was a great thing, a great thing. It worked. Um, and now it, I've been like, what like a year and a half meditating mm -hmm. and 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 i think you were right to say that it was the thing that i probably needed most the harder it sounds to meditate the more you probably need it right mm -hmm. 
what have been the benefits for you of meditation would you say discipline's the biggest benefit i find in what sense well trying to do something twice a day uh unless it's eating or breathing is pretty difficult most people aren't able to maintain something with such vigor and i mean there's i don't need to list the benefits of meditation i think everybody understands that meditation is a good thing no matter what form that you practice um but the twice a day and really sticking to it it was an exercise in myself proving that i could do something i could stick to these rules no matter what was going on in my life uh, whether it was work or being a burning man or whether you're really happy or really sad just sticking to it that i think discipline is the thing people don't always talk about when it relates to tm specifically since it it is um tm is transcendental meditation in case you don't know yeah they say that you don't get the benefits of tm unless you really do it twice a day uh and then i would you know everyone that i've ever met who's maintained a consistent practice for 10 20 you know 30 plus years undeniably have this sort of um it's like they're floating it's really interesting david lynch of course is a great example of this who's been practicing for i don't know 40 plus years maybe more but even the teachers uh, at the tm center um and i i desire that i haven't reached that yet but i'm on my way i i i like this uh metaphor i heard someone describe as meditation is like driving every time you have a a thought it's like you're veering out of your lane and and the goal is not to like eliminate thoughts but just to come back you're just steering back to the middle so every time that you have a wandering thought you don't resist it but then you you realize you're having the thoughts and then you come back to the mantra that's coming back to the center of the road and the more you do that you're practicing focus which for me is the greatest challenge like what i my my biggest challenge in life having a life that's very free and a life that i wouldn't trade for anyone's um the the drawback of that that comes with that freedom is a lack of structure and a lack of focus and what i hope that this has helped and that you know the 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 difference is subtle, but it's definite, and it's led to some of these uh, the the following changes that we've made. I think uh, what was the uh, so so then Dulcine started sneakily at first, and then <laughs> brazenly um, vaping, and then along with everyone else. I just want to say it was like a cultural phenomenon. <laughs> Blame the culture, sure. But it was uh, the summer of the elf bar. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Yeah. I mean, everybody who, uh, in our friend group at least, who had smoked all of a sudden, like at the same time, were all sucking on little juice box <laughs> vapes. <laughs> I was just one of many. Anyway, this became as is often the case with the technological fix of a drug um, that at first promises to alleviate and improve upon the previous iteration of the addiction it ends up being worse so my father used to talk about this a lot when it came to drugs that um you know, in the beginning, each culture has a drug, which is a way of uh, connecting with nature, connecting with a different part of your of yourself, uh, of of disconnecting from your uh, everyday concerns and connecting with maybe something transcendental. So, uh, for example, 
you know, there is the traditional psychedelic drugs that exist in, in the, in the Americas. There was opium in the far East and in the Middle East. There's wine in Europe. There's, uh, you know, marijuana in North Africa, chewing coca leaves in the Andes. All of these have great spiritual and physical benefits. And then what happens is technology comes along and offers a quote unquote cure for something that probably didn't ever need to be cured. So with opium, which was my father's drug of choice, um, the Westerner came in and said, we have a cure for the this, this time consuming practice of opium. Uh, you can just take morphine. And morphine was something that could just be put in a pill or an injection. And, and then the problem is they, of course, they soon discovered that morphine was much more addictive than, than opium. And so Bayer, that makes the aspirin, uh, the, the pharmaceutical company, came up with the non-addictive uh, replacement for morphine and touted it as a miracle drug. Not only could it help you with morphine addiction because it was the non-addictive alternative, but it was also very good for coughs and um, as a cough suppressant and it was called heroin and that went on for years until it didn't take too long to figure out that that was much worse than either the opium or the morphine and then uh, they came out with methadone which they said oh well then it won't make you high you know you can the heroin addict can take this it'll take away the cravings and you don't have the problem of it making you high so then people got hooked on methadone. You don't get high, but you're very physically hooked and it gives you bone marrow cancer and it takes like a year to get off of it. And on it goes. So the, the tobacco, you have a beautiful tradition of, of tobacco smoke in the you know Native American culture. They would bring people together as a focal practice around a, a you know burning tobacco, or then it turned into a pipe, which was the first kind of technological fix, but still kind of beautiful and traditional handcrafted pipes. Then that becomes the cigarette. The cigarette is, you know, cheap, disposable, fast. It overtook the entire world until people discovered it gives you lung cancer. And then the vape was offered as a replacement of the cigarette, as if it was like the healthy alternative. And I'm sure, sure, sure that it's going to be discovered that the vape is worse for you than the cigarette. And this is what I was pleading with Dulcinea, please stop with the vape. <laughs> And um, what was the next? I just, can I ask, what's your history with cigarettes and smoking? Um, I started smoking when I was 13 and uh, sneaking cigarettes from my parents. My mom and dad both separately smoked. My, my, I grew up surrounded by cigarette smoke in, you know, in Italy. And when I was growing up in the late 70s and 80s, there was no place you weren't allowed to smoke. You could smoke in the airplane. You could smoke in the in, in houses. You could smoke in elevators. You'd smoke in restaurants. Um, there was never not a cigarette in people's mm. hands. Oops. Um, and of course, I started smoking when I was like 13 and um, and struggled ever since. Um, I, I quit kind of definitively on my 40th birthday. Um, and then it's kind of it started creeping up again. And being around smokers is very hard for me because I don't have a lot of self-discipline. So if people are smoking, especially my partner, I can't not smoke. And I, as now, you know, I'm 47, I like to have, a, I start to really appreciate the fragility of the human body and try and come up with practices and, you know, surround myself with people who have health as a primary concern because otherwise I know that I'm not... Uh, I'm not capable on my own with sheer willpower from resisting that. So there was definitely a, you know, a, a desire for my own uh, healthfulness uh, in addition to the a desire not to see you destroy your lungs. So you said, oh, well, we didn't ever say anything about vaping. So I had to continue with the it's TM. True. And it's true. So what the was the fine print? I think you have an auto tune. We've been making music, which Do we'll I have get an to. Auto -tune on? There's an auto tune on. No. Yeah, it is. It's on the on the main main thing. It's okay. It's subtle enough. Well, let's just leave it. It'll take too long to to undo. Okay. So what was the next bargain we made? Um. No vaping for a very limited use of social media on Tao's part. 
Yes. It was actually very specific to Instagram or no? Is it both? I can't remember. Yeah, it was specific to Instagram, but this th th that will get us to the final deal that we made. Um, but I thought that the my phone addiction because you could look at the screen time and see that the most used app on the phone was Instagram and you also recognized that it was kind of co-opting my creativity um my desire was always to document everything since I was a kid I was always the one first one with the camera the only one with the camera before like smartphones came out I had film cameras always around my neck. I had a constant desire to document the world around me. And Instagram was very good at co-opting that desire and channeling it into something small and something insignificant. The medium is the message, as Marshall McLuhan famously said. So rather than Instagram being a way to express yourself, which is what it, it sells itself as, you become a tool for it to express itself. What and do you think the message of Instagram is? I think that it commodifies everything, commodifies your experiences. It's using all of its users to create an, a giant distraction. Um, I, I think it has redeeming qualities in the sense that it is an image and with text underneath it and i think that you know in in stronger hands it might be great but i think it has Can you say more on that i think there are artists who use it well like who i don't know i can't think of anybody <laughs> off the top of my head but i think the medium has its own essence right so um you know it's not if if a medium didn't have an essence it wouldn't be a medium so i think that the the piano sounds like a piano and the discipline that it brings and the connection it brings to the instrument is very specific to itself and that's the beauty of it um each instrument and 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 this guy albert borgman a philosopher used to distinguish between uh an instrument and a device a device is defined by the fact that a the, it, it's indistinguishable who's uh, who's using it you don't really get to know it you can't really tinker with your phone you can't be like you know bring out its essence it's very one size fits all uh, everyone's iPhone is the same in a way that's democratizing like you know Elon Musk has the same iPhone than we do but it also is like an impoverished relationship. Like my relationship to my piano is specific to my, to this instrument's history. I know where it was made. I know how, how, you know, where it came from, where it lived. It brings out certain emotions and certain like ways of interacting with it that are very specific, very different than another piano let alone another instrument a guitar or something like that it's very it's a unique relationship that individuates it and you and the device does neither of those things and so what the device does is it levels all meaningful differences and the phone as a device and instagram as a medium on that device packages every experience into this little consumable commodity that is making Instagram and now Meta, the company that owns it, a lot of money. So I think it's about that. The, the piano makes me no money. So that's that's also part of what makes it great. I think you know. So I think we we you know I I, I instinctively knew that we had to like get away. F I needed to get away from this medium because it wasn't healthy for me. Again, we're going back to this kind of health, health, California emphasis on healthfulness. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it was again, a bargain that we made. You quit vaping. I quit Instagram. The problem was that I realized that the phone was the medium, not Instagram. And my, my, my screen time was like appallingly eight hours a day or something. I don't know that the phone was the medium. Or the phone was the thing that was... Go on, say more about that. 
I mean, you weren't doing anything with it, like expressing, you know, I, don't, I just don't think the phone was the medium. The phone was the drug. The it's phone a, was the heroin. Yeah. I the can problem hear is the auto tune. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we should try and turn it off. Hold on. Uh, why don't you talk about the phone being not a medium while I see if I can turn off the auto tune? Um, I mean, the phone is is it's a device. It's a tool. I don't, oh, we're going further. <laughs> Um, I think that, I don't know, I don't have actually much to say on that because I think it's a bit pedantic. I think we all understand that the phone is not a medium. What is it? It's a device. It's a tool. We use it to do things. We don't really use it to express ourselves or to create things. I mean, you could say you use the camera to create things, but that's a camera. And I don't think that the phone camera is a different medium. I think it's not as good as a normal camera, but or interesting. Because again, there's a flattening of the tools available to you. But in another sense, it you know gives everybody a camera. And I know people have fun expressing themselves using the iPhone camera. Though I think they could also go out and buy an old film camera and learn more about the medium of photography. But that's just my opinion. But of course, the the camera itself was a technological, you know, threat to painting. So I want to I want to like be subtle and nuanced about this because we're always there's always this push-pull with technology. The first technology was fire. Um, then we had things like the alphabet, you know, which and writing, which, you know, Plato famously, you know, railed against. Um, or Socrates did, and Plato wrote about, ironically. So we always have these technologies that we're presented with whose promise and it's a double-edged sword. It's the promise is to alleviate the need for skillfulness and the difficulty of doing something. If you wanted to take a, a, a make a portrait of somebody, you used to have to take spend years learning, and then you would sit with the portrait. Uh, you know, the, the painter would sit with the subject, and of course, that was a meaningful, deep, prolonged experience. And the camera comes along and just removes that. Um, and now we go back nostalgically to, oh, a real film camera. It's hilarious because, of course, that's a highly technological device, the camera. But well, it, it comes in stages. I'm just talking about in relationship to the iPhone. I wasn't going all the way back. Yeah. But there, there are always these stages, right? There's always yeah. these, like, the alphabet gives rise to the... The, 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 you know, once we went from tablets to handwritten books and imagine the monks that used to sit and copy, make handwritten copies because there was no press. Then Gutenberg comes along with the printing press. Suddenly an art is lost and another thing is gained. Do you think it's a bit strange that you're like, I think our positioning is a little strange. I know. Because you're just looking at yourself. No, I'm looking at you, actually. No, you're looking at yourself. Nope. <laughs> I'm looking at you. I promise. Well, I'm, not, I'm just looking into space. No, you're looking over there, too. Otherwise, you wouldn't know that I was looking at you. No, I could tell, but... What if I make this full screen? Does that position. help? I don't, I don't need to look at the can screen. Can you see there? We're being mediated by a screen and a camera right now. Because we've been making music together, and this is our setup. And... Um, I actually like this shot, <laughs> but it is a little odd because, you know, my back is to Dalton. <laughs> but I can see you there. So I'm actually seeing, like, making nice eye contact with you for, well, for me. Well, I can see you. Well, you can hear me. <laughs> um, okay, so technology as a medium, or as a, as a mediator that has, that it, it, it also, it, it, it tends to, disguise itself the technology withdraws and it pretends to be a transparent medium 
and instead it's a very very intensely kind of prevalent like it how do I want to say this it colors what it's mediating in a much stronger way than it pretends to so the, the Instagram pretends to just be a medium for you to uh, communicate and express yourself but it took years for me to understand that it was doing more than that and I would always try and justify it and, and in a way I'm glad that I used it the way I did for so long I did go deep into it um it did, you know, open up many experiences. I did print out every Instagram I ever did into like 80 volumes of little books. And I have those sitting on my shelf and it's a kind of a diary. So there are, there are ways of using the technology in ways that are, that resist th those tendencies. And I'll continue to do that. You know, I think that, that it's a, but you, but awareness, awareness of the pitfalls is the number one um step you know first 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 step to healing is to admit you have a problem i guess <laughs> um so anyway so so you you we made the deal to get to get me off of instagram and you off the vaping and i in horror saw that my screen time gave a got a momentary bump down from eight hours to four hours or something but it crept back up and it crept back up in a way that made it even worse. Cause at least on Instagram, I did feel like I was documenting and expressing myself, but now I felt like I was doing nothing. And I, I, I looked in horror that my, my screen time was eight hours again, a few weeks ago. And I wasn't even going on Instagram. I was just reading the news and going on Reddit and Twitter and chat GPT. Chat GPT is very, uh, that's something that I, I think I, I go to here and there, but I don't think it's, we disagree on this, but I don't think that's anywhere close to any sort of addiction because hmm. probably my chat GPT time is like, you know, at most 10 minutes a day. Um, there must have been times that it was more. Well, when I was working on this film that we're making together, in which I'm going to be using chat GPT as a major tool and character in it in a way. Um, Anyway, um, the next bargain. <laughs> Once I realized it was the phone, I tried really hard to get off the phone. And this was the hardest one of all. I really felt like a heroin addict. And I felt kind of uh, envy for heroin addicts because a heroin addict like fixes, you know, twice a day. And I was fixing like... 450 times a day picking up the phone and so it felt more like a you know crack addiction or something something that you have to do all the time um and I, I i was at a loss with what to do and i thought well it's time to make another some got to figure out some sort of like game to to get off the phone <laughs> And you too admit that your phone time was getting a little out of hand, right? Mm -hmm. What's your relationship to the phone and to the, the tech? I go through pretty... I go through phases with it. Um, when I'm like in... When I'm depleted and in an in-between state uh, or recovering or, you know... When I'm not feeling my fullest self, it definitely tends towards the phone. And when I'm working a sort of job that doesn't require my necessarily my full attention, but I can't do something else that's interesting, like I can't be reading a book, but I'm working, but again, it doesn't require my full attention or there are these pauses in between. I find myself going on the phone because that's a socially acceptable thing to do. 
in the sense that you can't be sitting there on the job reading a book, but if you're on your phone, nobody really cares, which is fascinating. Um, there's an interesting cognitive dissonance there. Um, so, yeah, in the past few weeks, I've been in transit, traveling, coming back from Burning Man, recovering from being sick, uh, working, um, and so my phone time was, was up a lot, and I was also feeling a desire to re, just get off of it, which I don't find very difficult. I mean, I've, I've gone through periods of, of really not being on social media for quite a long time, and I don't, once you're off of it, I don't find that it's difficult, um, and I really enjoy remembering how many minutes there are in the day and reestablishing a relationship with time that exists outside of the endless supply of new information or yeah I guess it can, it can be new it can be old it can be remixed but something very strange happens to the experience of time when you spend a lot of time on your phone uh, you lose that I think a natural rhythm and so getting off of it is this reintroduction of of the minutes that make up a day and what you can do with them yeah again i want to keep coming back to this medium is the message that marshall McLuhan. if you don't know him look him up his work and his thoughts on on media are really prescient because you know it's a simple enough observation but it's deep the idea that when you're watching tv which was the medium that he was writing about a lot it's not about what's on the tv it's about you watching tv like that's a more significant fact than what you're watching so um and and then how tv shapes the culture how like the, it's reorients our you know our living rooms themselves were like changed so that you know they were like facing a tv now and um and so all of those facts about the tv were mu much more interesting to think about and much more worthy of our attention than whatever happened to be on the tv and what happens to be on the TV is often just like a repackaging of the previous medium. So when movies were invented, they started putting theater on the movies. When TV was invented, they started putting movies on the TV, right? And then, um, you know, now we watch TV shows on our phone. And um, so it's just a kind of convenient to just like co-opt whatever came before. Uh, but again, if you take that message and you look at the fact that we're staring at our phone for eight hours a day, what we're staring at is a minuscule percentage of the import and the significance of the fact that we're look that that we're that we're our lives are oriented and like you said it's socially acceptable the only reason why we aren't calling each other out on being these like crackheads is the fact that we all have the addiction so when someone picks up their phone we're like oh, it's okay i can pick it up too now and and I started to feel this like in a sense of like, like, you know, I'm a pretty lucky to be a happy person, but it was taking that happiness away from my, 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 my normal kind of equilibrium of that, of, of my brain chemistry that I'm blessed to have, uh, you know, land at a place of usually of equanimity and 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 general kind of well-being was i saw it going away as i spent more and more time staring at this phone and again it also does tend towards banality so even though you could be reading dostoevsky on your phone and it's there it's incredible we have access to all human knowledge and imagine if you told somebody 500 years ago that in the future people are gonna have these devices with all of human knowledge not only that you could print books but that the you could pull up any book it would be magic it would be extraordinary it would be considered a miracle you would think wow everybody's going to be so just cultured and well-read and but lo that's not what happens 
you're not reading Dostoevsky on the phone. You're tending towards reading more and more banal and uh, insignificant things because the medium encourages that in a very subtle and nefarious way. I also don't think that it, it has all of human knowledge. I think this is a gross generalization that many people tout, but it's not true. There's a lot of knowledge that's not on the internet. Example. Um, I, I don't need an example. Like I want an my, example. My sort of lived experience is an example. My journals are an example. Anyone who's ever written something that hasn't been digitized, um, there must be countless numbers of poems, secrets, uh, emotions, revelations that haven't been digitized, haven't been published or put on the internet. Um, and then just the, I feel like there's knowledge in every interaction that knowledge to be gleaned um, in observation that is again not digitized, perhaps not even written down, but could be orally transmitted to someone um, through language. Yeah, and I suppose like also experiences like having dinner with somebody. Absolutely. You could watch a YouTube video of people having dinner, but it's not, it has nothing to do with uh, well, There's something about actually lived, having dinner. Yeah, lived experience. Maybe knowledge is a tricky word but there's certainly a lot of value that isn't in the magical phone device. Isn't it interesting that we're going back to maybe a time when, because when we resist this stuff, we go back to trying to rediscover those things that can't be mediated through technology. And, you know, a simple thing like a walk can become a more profound experience knowing what it's like to not have that anymore. So again, like back to the uh, this idea of like how do we how do we come up with ways in our relationship to not like oh god you're on your phone again can you stop like it wasn't that it was a shared desire to be our best selves and use like competition games bargain making deal making to achieve that and you were working in the job in New York and I was. Uh, racking my brain for knowing that you were going to come here and we were going to have like a little bit of time of domestic bliss together. Um, I was trying to find a way to, to, to gamify and challenge our, each other to actually get off the phones. And a big light bulb went off over my head on the way to the airport. And I was like, I've got it. <laughs> and what I, what I thought was we could compete for who has less screen time on the phone and the, the, we could, we could uh, at the end of each day or the following day, check uh, our, our screen time. And then we could take the difference in that time. And if you have more time on your phone, you have all of a sudden the other person owns that amount of time uh, of yours. So if I have 30 minutes more than Dulcine on the phone, she can ask for a 30 minute massage or she can uh, give me a task of something that I have not been wanting to do uh, <laughs> to do for that time. And both of us being very competitive humans took this to heart and like immediately our screen time went down to under an <laughs> hour. It's incredible. But the, the result has been this kind of moving back to a time before the smartphone for me. Um, and again, I don't want to be like a, a Luddite or like a, you know, overly like dwell in nostalgia, but there was something and is something that has been lost that I'm finding is refound and uh, through this experience. And I, being someone who does like constant stimulation, I need something to read. If I can't read the phone, I'm going to pick up a book. And suddenly the book, I realize, is more profound than what I was reading on the, on the phone. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> Even though if, I, if I'm reading something really silly, like P.G. Woodhouse, which is my favorite. 
uh, lighthearted comic reading. Um, you know, f having to like dive deeper into a set of characters and try a little harder to get that entertainment uh, is a hugely va valuable experience. And so I was inspired to make this podcast this morning because I thought like this is these are some good techniques that we've developed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good to share them with the world. <laughs> um, I also wanted to kind of Oh, speaking of P.G. Woodhouse um, and my father living in a time that was much more primitive in terms of the binary, I want to figure out like ways to push back at these cliches, but also acknowledge them. Um, my father used to say the problem with relationships between men and women is that women always want to change a man and he'll never change <laughs> and all that men want is for the woman not to change and my god does she change he would say <laughs> 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 so um again I, i've hinted at the fact that we've moved past this kind of simplistic and um you know caricatured binariness but i wanted to ask you your thoughts of these gender roles as they apply in our dynamic i think everybody no matter what their gender is um in queer relationships i i think everybody wants everybody to change and not in a way that's um terrible I don't think it's a bad desire. I, I I think we want this even in our friends, you know, in our platonic relationships, that when you really love somebody, you want them to, like nobody's perfect, and you want them to be their best selves. And the delicate dance is to know when or even if to communicate that. But I think even if one is not communicating that, one is probably thinking it all the time. And maybe this is just a projection of myself. Um, but in my conversations with, with people, I mean, I think it's, it's a balance. You have to love someone exactly as they are and want them to be their best selves and also see their potential to be their best selves because everyone is always changing in a way, um, even if they're changing and then reverting to previous habits, changing and reverting, changing and reverting. I don't think that we're static creatures. Um, but yeah, and I think, I think, you know, the ideal of the partnership is, is this idea that you have somebody ideally in a way that is not oppressive and not controlling, but in a way that is cultivating and supportive and supportive of of being uh your your the best iteration of yourself we all know you know like the various yous that exist in you and whether mm -hmm. you give you know the the less lofty one more control um it, and it's a, it's a bad feeling you know like and so you were away and i was alone some people thrive in solitude but that's when i was at my worst in terms of like, you know, nine hours a day on the fucking phone and feeling like shit about it and feeling self-loathing and, uh, you know, feeling of just unground, untetheredness. Mm. And um, it's nice to have somebody who keeps you, keeps you honest, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so like, how do you achieve that in a partnership is hard because you do have to control the urge to um to you know think you have you know more jurisdiction than you do on somebody's life in the end you know i do believe that one of the things you know our relationship is based on on openness on a lot of freedom on a lot of autonomy um, and we've built trust over time yeah you know there's a foundation of trust and um yeah i think that's an important thing you you shouldn't come out the gate when you're 
It's starting a new relationship, I think. Uh, but you also have to take the time to get to know someone and to really see who they are, how they change themselves over time, and um, what the context is always. And so it's it's a delicate dance. So, my, I, again, I, I want to recommend... P.G. Woodhouse to people who haven't <laughs> discovered him. <laughs> My former in-laws, the Coburns, um, they there was they were all journalists and writers. And Alexander Coburn, who was a dear friend and mentor to me, said that the Coburn style guide was uh, to become a great writer. All you need is to read Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which is a very dense history of the Roman Empire written in the late 1700s. I've tried. It's very, very difficult. And the complete works of P.G. Woodhouse. And if you read both of those things, you can't but become a great writer. And the, um, the, the delight in Woodhouse is that, you know, uh, to, to take very lighthearted situations with very little depth or significance and use that as a medium for delighting in the construction of great metaphors, similes, and just brilliant use of the English language and rediscovering these books, which I also enjoy listening to. If you like to, if you prefer audiobooks, there's a, a guy named Jonathan Cecil, who's a, uh, who's a, um, english comedian and he reads reads the books with you know making different voices for the different characters and anyway so there's like i think like seven or eight books about about uh a hapless young spoiled brat of an aristocrat named uh bertram worcester and all of the kind of troubles he gets himself into and then he gets rescued by his much uh wiser and uh cleverer butler named uh, or actually gentleman's personal gentleman is what he is not actually a butler butler is something different that you'll learn if you dig into these but he's he's always a bachelor because he doesn't want to go deeper and improve himself in this way and so so every time he gets engaged to a woman the woman often you know brighter than he is figure sees his flaws soon enough and then wants to change him and then he doesn't want to be changed and therefore he goes back to being a bachelor and i i pulled up this quote he says uh you know how it is with these earnest brainy beezles of what is ca called strong character they can't let the male soul alone they want to get behind it and start shoving scarcely have they shaken the rice from their hair in the car driving off for the honeymoon that they pull up their socks and begin molding the partner of joys and sorrows and there's one thing that gives me the pip it's being molded despite adverse criticism from many quarters the name of my aunt agatha is the one that springs to the lips i like bertram worcester the way he is lay off of him i say don't try to change him or you may lose the flavor. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to read that thinking, absolutely. I mean, I dig well, my I heels in. <laughs> I think um, any efforts to, to encourage self-improvement is actually to achieve more flavor. And that's... I mean, I, with the phone, it was only taking you away from the world around you, the people around you, and myself being one of those people, it wasn't, um, or I wanted more flavor. <laughs> I didn't want to change the flavor. I just wanted the flavor in in a way that was complete and full and I really think that in this day and age one of the greatest gifts that you can give to another person uh, when you find themselves in their presence is your presence and an interrupt uninterrupted presence is quite rare and so when I find myself sitting down 
uh, with someone, whether it's a friend for a chat or it's like a business meeting or anything of the like, um, it's few and far between to have someone who really sits down and looks at you the entire time. It's a real gift. And, um, and, and I think I think you're absolutely right. And what you, when you 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 find out how all consuming the phone is when you allow, you know, I'm still restless and I'm still probably not going to sit down and like like talk to you for two hours looking at you. But the distractions that are available in a kind of more natural way are so much less nefarious, right? Like, you know, I'm running to the kitchen now and making ice cream or like, um, you know, yeah, cooking or let's go for a walk or let's do like things that actually don't take you away nearly as much. And I find it, you know, people who... I really admire have been like caught up in this. Like you talk to them and they're like looking at their phone. At, and of course, there's always a good excuse, whether it's work or I want to show you this thing or and just cutting it out and uh, and just having some friction. This was the, big, the, the, big, the good thing about the game is that it adds there's right now it's too frictionless. Like there's nothing between you and picking up the phone. It's in your pocket. It's there presenting you with if not all the knowledge in the world, a fucking lot of stuff, right? A lot of stuff that's seemingly surface, like worth looking at, you know? Um, But again, the medium is the message. Even, you know, reading P.G. Woodhouse in these, I've like rediscovered this love of the actual physical books, this series like that there's a particular kind of edition that came out like 15 years ago and it's got this beautiful matte covers on these hardback, you know, and the, the, the holding of the book in your hand. So it's not just the words. It's not just the words. In fact, just reading you that 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 part off the screen wasn't nearly as delightful as it was when I was reading it on the off the book. You know, I went and found it off of Google and out of the context and on the screen. Not as good. You know, it's not as flavorful. We're fleshy material beings and uh, we like fleshy material things. Um, whether that's nature, cooking, whether we know it or remember it uh, because we were trained to forget it. But there is, no matter how awesome technology is, how it makes our lives our lives easier um, or accelerates what we might call progress, I think we will always be fleshy material beings that enjoy being in the fleshy material world and i think again i i want to find ways to incorporate the the technology in healthy ways that is you know creative and beautiful and engaged i think part of that is to remember that even even the technology is is made of stuff we forget that you know like Digital stuff is still stuff. There's circuits in there that are, you know, buzzing away. The computer's getting hot. Um, you know, there there is no escaping the materiality of the materiality of the world. But I think acknowledging when you're, it when you're ahead. dealing with a with a phone or, I mean, your computer is malfunctioning, and so you're dealing with the materiality of it in a different way. But when it's not malfunctioning, you're not dealing with the materiality of it. Um, I I agree with you. Everything is material. And yet, um, I mean, the world's out here, right here, you know, it's funny. My, my older brother once said to me, like, we were talking on the phone and he was complaining about our addiction to, you know, to, to our smartphones. And he was like, we we so rarely just do something like in the old days, like just talk on the phone. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? Like, that's using the phone too, right? Like, but the, 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 there is something about actually talking to somebody instead of texting with them and hearing their voice. Um, you know, one thing I do 
enjoy doing is listening to podcasts with the screen. You know, I, that's not screen time. If you're just listening to something, maybe it should be, maybe we should just like completely separate from it. But I do find that listening to audiobooks, listening to podcasts is uh, less soul destroying. <laughs> there, there are like gradations within the digital world of better and worse, I think. Like listening to this podcast is something you shouldn't stop doing. <laughs> um, Everything in moderation. That's especially moderation. Indeed. Um, anyway, this is also just uh, I love do I love this I love this medium of the podcast of checking in in this way, having a nice conversation. It is ironic that we're not facing each other. <laughs> it feels quite strange for me. I, I'm not, I'm just not looking at anything except for your synth. <laughs> My synth. Oh yeah, I'm glad you said that. Because the other reason I wanted to do this podcast is to introduce our duo, which is called D slash T, Dulcine and Tau. Um, <laughs> D slash T, uh, I was fantasizing over the last several months about making music to your poetry, also of breaking you out of your shell and the you know and kind of getting you to rediscover your singing voice, which I understand was very developed at one point, and you've let go, but you were a choral singer, a trained classical singer. Am I correct? Yes. And so I, the way I've been trying to trick Dulcine into rediscovering that is she's she's not shy with her poetry. So um, we've been making music. Uh, uh, D on the drum machine. Oh, D for drums. Uh, T for synth. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and you've been reading your poetry. We've... Uh, published uh three no two two or three experiments one instrumental experiment early on that we did as dt um just playing on the synths but also dulcinea encourages me to go deeper and darker in the music um i can tend towards wanting to just learn more lighthearted classical pieces or jazz instead dulcinea likes the dark primordial but technological, literally techno. <laughs> it's ironic, isn't it? I, love techno. I don't think it's ironic. Why? Techno because is all I, computers. I know, but I don't... I, I think we should distinguish between um, the vapid use of the internet as a way to spend time, which is what most people that's the problem that they have is is constant stimulation so just needing like new information whether that's emails texts um or scrolling or youtube videos i think that that is a decidedly different thing than using a synthesizer using a camera um making a movie like even watching a movie or listening to a podcast, like I think conflating those two things is not serving us really. Oh, sorry. Uh, really getting to the, to the, the, I think primary problem of our time. It's not like so bad to um, make techno, uh, you know, I, or listen to techno it's like, are you picking up your phone three, four, five hundred times a day and spending eight hours on social media apps? Yeah. I just want to make that distinction because I think that I can be someone who really enjoys technological music, music that's only made by machines, um, and also be someone who can outline uh, a, a, a not so productive use of technology which um well going back to being in the world the documentary which is now available on youtube for free if anyone wants to watch it um one of the one of the themes of the film is 
making the distinction between active skillful engagement with the world and passive consumption so i do think that you know when there's an effort involved and the development of a skill uh, and a desire to interact in a meaningful way with a medium you know music is a wonderful example of that uh it then you can embrace these instruments. But I do th want to remind people that what, when synthesizers first came out, there was a lot of hooing and hawing about how this could never be real music. And then people take it up, you know, same with the electric guitar, same with the piano itself, you know, uh, it was a technological device that was, you know, dismissed by, by certain people when it first came out. So... Um, but do you I, see how I, that's not really my point exactly because you said it was ironic that I love techno music why I think because it points at exactly what you're saying it's I not a facile really love distinction choral music yeah uh, just Pure yeah, I'm voices. just saying that you're not a traditionalist, and that's great. That shows what we're saying is not. I, 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 it reinforces what you're saying, and I, which I agree with. I think what it comes down to is how do we create uh, active, involved, risk-taking, meaningful uh, experiences, and you know, art, uh, um, uh, artifacts. You know, and also, I, it brings up for me the distinction between content and art. Mm, I hate the word content. Yes, go um, on. Music to my ears. Because everything that mostly what is on these apps um, is content. Um, and the word content just harks to, you know, it smacks of just something to fill. Right, you, yeah, content is something that fills something, fills yeah. fills a container. Right. Um, so I think you can make art using synths. You know, it's not content. Um, is there a difference between art and artifact for you? Um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um. I mean, I think every piece of art could be an artifact. But not every artifact and, is a piece is a work of art. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think we can like yeah you can you don't have to shoot for art, you can you can aim for artifact and sometimes achieve art. I think um, you know artifact is a, is on is on the road to art, and even if you can make an artifact, that's great. Just go away from making content and more than that, go away from consuming content. Because I do think if you just say, I'm going to spend a certain amount of time creating something instead of just uh, consuming things, that's a step. There are these practical steps that have worked for me that I want to like also advise uh, for those who want it. Unsolicited advice. You should <laughs> never give unsolicited advice. Um, but... Uh, one rule that I've done uh, is like there's a very strong, strong pull to pick up the phone when you first wake up in the morning. And I happen to wake up really early. So there's really no reason to like I don't there's no one looking for me at six in the morning when I wake up. So it's pure addiction uh, to to pick up the phone first thing. So right now I I've decided uh, that's not allowed. I for the first hour, no phone at all. Even not with even before our game, that was that was a first step towards that, and that just changes the the speaking of flavor. The flavor of the day is different when you wake up, and the first thing that happens isn't this little screen right in front of your eyes like this. If you open your eyes and look around the room, I also noticed that my eyesight was getting worse. So like I learned that it's not something you have to just give up on that your eyesight needs exercise it's a muscle and it's bad to just look at something that's six inches or 12 inches away from your face all day long you need to like look at things that are 20 feet away and 200 feet away and track things with your eyes so like now i've also taken like you have 30 seconds before your meditation that you like settle in i'll often take those 30 seconds and just look at something farther away and then when the 20 minutes starts then close my eyes um I'll, I'll go for a walk in the morning and not bring my glasses and try and make an effort to look at the horizon and also let the sun 
you know, it's just rising. Like that's really good for our circadian rhythms, supposedly. Um, going with the rhythm of the day. I also noticed I sleep worse. You know, we're allowed to look at our laptop, but the other night I stared at my laptop before bedtime and I noticed that I slept terribly. So now I'm going to try and like eliminate the screen for a couple of hours before bed. Uh, I do think these little kind of rules are that you can create for yourself are very beneficial. At least they work for me. I would love to know if other people have other techniques. Speaking of tech, it's interesting. The word technique has, has the word techne also, which is Greek. Um, there's a lot of Heidegger on techne and stuff, but anyway, we won't get into that. Um, do you have any closing thoughts, Dulcinea? Mm. I don't think so. Watching movies has been fun with you too. Mm-hmm. I do think, yeah, I mean, watching, it, it's it's fun. It, it, there's Sunset Boulevard, great film, 1949, I think. Um, you know, it's about a silent movie star who's forgotten when the technology of sound comes in, Nora Desmond, and she lives alone in this big mansion as she's aging, not very gracefully. And... Um, someone says to her i know you you used to be big and she says i'm still big it's the pictures that got smaller <laughs> and that was a really great dig at television in the late 40s <laughs> right the pictures got smaller can you imagine the horror that they would feel if they saw that we were watching these movies on screens that are like five inches across <laughs> it seems like a, a caricature of the direction of technology it seems like a joke they would think it was a joke if you could if you would say like to someone 50 years ago that people are going to watch movies on like the size of it would be like if you told someone today that they're going you're going to watch movies on this you know something the size of a postage stamp um <laughs> like are you kidding but that's what's happened right the the, the pictures are getting smaller so that it's nice to like hark back to the bigness of the world, first of all. That's mm. the biggest movie. And then like watching a movie, just even just 20 feet away on a TV across the room now feels like a more natural, ironically. That's ironic. That's a little bit ironic that mm -hmm. you think watching a movie is a way to be more connected to like tradition because the movies have become traditional. Yeah. Well, I'm also a filmmaker. Yeah. It is my medium. Anyway, lots of lots of good thoughts uh, to unpack. Mostly, I appreciate you, Dulcinea. I appreciate, appreciate you. I appreciate our partnership. I appreciate the 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 playing with that tension as we do in our mediums between like tradition and stability and. Uh, experimentation, freedom, avant-gardeness. Uh, I think that we do the same thing in our relationship. We have like a certain uh, uh, kind of pleasure in, you know, things like traditional domesticity <laughs> and at the same time can be wildly open and non-traditional. And I think that playing with those with that binary and flipping it and doing so constantly is part of what keeps everything so fun and sexy and fresh and stimulating intellectually and creatively and spiritually. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. Oh my God. One hour and 10 minutes. Okay. More soon.